Welcome everybody. I hope everybody can hear me good. Please give me some feedback in the chat so I know that the voice is coming through right. Okay. Welcome everyone to this free online webinar of the School of the Holy Science. Um, I will not be able to answer the questions you put in the chat online, but my colleague Swim will uh, hopefully answer them. The questions he's not able to answer, uh, I will read them in the break or at the end, and then I will answer them uh, at that moment. Okay, so let's start with it. The subject of this webinar is the science of creation. And it consists of uh, of a lot of, uh, of seven parts and in fact is it, this is also a part of holy science because the, the whole of holy science is much broader than only this subject. For those of you who are not familiar with me or my work when you go to the website pateo.nl you will find a lot of information about what I've been doing lately. Uh, a lot of video presentations are there as well. Three ebooks you can read uh, for free online and uh, many articles. Maybe it's also interesting at, the, at that website, if you go to the English section and you click on Pateo Academia, then you find uh, the scientists with, with whom I'm working closely at this moment. One of them is uh, Santos Bonacci. He's also uh, very active within the School of the Holy Science. Um, so yeah, you find more on Pateo.nl. Pateo, by the way, is a Latin word which means no longer hidden. And um, the goal I have with Pateo is to, to make as much uh, holy science and uh, put it into the public domain. So it's no longer a secret anymore. Holy science. Yes, science and spirituality are strongly connected. When we disconnect those two, then we get something that is really not, not in balance. For instance, if we have science without spirituality, we find really dead and soulless science. And that's in fact the science we can find at the universities. Everybody feels, at least I feel it, and I think a lot of people too, that the science there is, is not having any soul at all. It's, uh, it's in the mind, it's fantasy. To me it's not real science, to me that is science fiction. But the other side is also true. When we have spirituality without science, then it is more like fantasy, and it's ungrounded. It doesn't have a strong base, a, a, a firm base. So we need to understand that spirituality and science are in fact two sides of the same coin. And uh, we need both of them to understand the, the whole of everything, the holy science. So the holy science has spirituality within its core. The things I'm going to present today have also been written down in this online ebook. Uh, you can find it on the website of pateo.nl. The title is Holy Science. And the subtitle is Understanding the Process of Creation. So most of the stuff I'm going to talk about is also there. If it's going too fast, you can just open this ebook and uh, read it page by page. In order to understand holy science, there are three different approaches. But they are complementary to each other, because in fact they end up with the same result. To me, holy science is the study of harmony. And we can study harmony through music, through geometry, and through numbers. And in this webinar, we'll see each of these three approaches. And we see that they actually have exactly the same results. This is the contents of uh, the table of contents of this uh, webinar. I will start in part one with discussing the seven days of the week. Everybody knows those seven days, but not everybody knows that they are directly related to the seven visible lights around us, the, the heavenly bodies that surround our mother planet. Then in part two, we look at the seven days of creation as it has been described in the Bible and especially the first chapter of the book of Genesis. So we'll actually look at the, the literal words used in that book of uh, Genesis and see what it actually means. Then we find the three approaches, geometry and numbers and 30 music. 
each of them showing exactly the same as also the first chapter of the creation of the, the Bible is telling us. Then in part six we look at the gods of creation. And if you look carefully at this, uh, the description in Genesis, then you can see what those gods really are. And finally, the seventh part, we talk about not only the gods, but also the idols. Those people think they are gods, but those idols are not really gods at all. So this is part one, the seven days of the week. Here we see the seven days of the week. And they are directly related to the seven visible lights around us. Two of those lights are very familiar to most people, I think. That is the first one, Luna, the moon, and the middle one, Helios, or the sun. I'll explain later why I use different names than moon and sun, because both moon and sun are just um, names of types, not, not the real names. So uh, that's why I use Luna and Helios. When we look at the order, from Luna to Mercury, Venus, Helios, Mars, Jupiter, and finally Saturn. That is the order of relatively uh, relative speed. The uh, speed to complete a full circle, a full orbit. For instance, the Moon requires 29 and a half days to make a full orbit around our home planet. Mercury requires 88 days to make a full orbit around the Sun, Helios. Then we find Venus is 20, 225 days to make a full orbit. Uh, then, yeah, Helios is not actually making an orbit around our home planet, it's the other way around. But from our perspective, from the surface of Terra, our home planet, it looks like it takes 365 and about a quarter of a day uh, to make a full circle through the signs of the zodiac of the Sun, Helios. And March is much, much many, much more days, 687. Jupiter is even, even far more, more than 4,000, 4,333. And then finally, the most slowest one, the most uh, the, the orbit that takes most time, is the one of Saturn. It takes more than 10,000 of our days, of our rotations around our axis. Uh, but the funny part is, 10,760 days is also 29 and a half years. So while the moon, Luna, takes 29 and a half days to make a full orbit, Saturn takes 29 and a half years to make a full orbit around Helios. So that's really funny, I think. So the moon, on Monday we honor the moon. On Wednesday we honor Mercury. But the name Wednesday and Mercury are totally different. But in French it's more clear because the French name for Wednesday is Mercredi. And Mercredi, we can see the reference to Mercury. And the same is true for Mercredi, that's Italian. On Friday, we honor Venus. Again, in English it's not really clear, but in French it's Vendredi. And there we see the, uh, the reference to Venus. And also in Italian, Venerdi is the day of Vener, Venus. Sunday is, of course, the day of the Sun, Helios. And on Tuesday, we honor Mars. But again, choose and Mars are totally different words. And in French it's clear again, because Mardi is the, de, is the, de, the, the day of Mars. And also in Italian, Martedì, the day of Marte. And Thursday, Thursday is the day of thunder, of Thor. We'll come back to that later. But in French it's Jeudi. Jeudi is the day of Jupiter. Most clear it is in Italian, because Giove is the Italian word for Jupiter. So Giovedi means literally Jupiter day. But we say Thursday, but in fact it should be, if we want to make it more clear, should be Jupiter day. And then we have Saturday. If we add one N to it after Saturn, then we get Saturn day. And that is of course the reference to Saturn, the slowest rotating, uh, orbiting planet around us, of these visible lights. Now let us look at the order. First we see the odd numbers and then the even numbers. So it's 1, 3, 5, 7, 2, 4, 6. There must be a rhythm. There is a rhythm when we look at the next slide. And that rhythm clearly shows how it goes because it starts at Luna, at the Moon, at the Moon Day, or the Monday. Then it goes with a straight line to Mars, that's Tuesday. Then with a straight line to Mercury, it's Wednesday, 
Then a straight line to Jupiter. That's Thursday. Straight line to Venus. Friday. Straight line to Saturn. Saturn day or Saturday. And then with a straight line to Helios, or the Sun, the Sunday. And then back to the Moon, Monday. So when we see, when we follow this, this seven pointed star, then we see the beautiful rhythm of the days of the week. What you also can see here is that Luna, Mercury and Venus uh, can be considered as female planets or yin planets. While Mars, Jupiter and Saturn can be considered as uh, male planets. So that's, that's the male part on the right hand side and the female part on the left side. And Helios is not of course a real planet, it's a sun or a star. So that's how we can also see uh, this, this beautiful uh, figure. We say moon, but as, as I said before, the moon is just the name of a type of a planet. It's namely a planet that's orbiting around another planet. That's a moon. So it's not really a name. Um, but, but for instance, in Sumeria, it was called Nana. Nana is, a, is an actual name. And what I find funny is that most babies, new infants who learn to speak, the first word they mostly say is Nana. So maybe that <laughs> maybe that has some meaning. In Babylonia, they use the word Sin. Maybe the word Sinner is, is re referring to the moon, I don't know. Sanskrit is Chandra. Ancient Greece, there were two names to refer to the moon Luna. Both Artemis and Selene are references to the moon Luna. In the Roman, in the Roman, ancient Roman time, it was called Diana. I use the Latin word Luna, which in fact also means moon, but it's a little bit different than the word moon. So that's Monday, honoring of the moon Luna. On Tuesday, we honor Mars. And again, for Mars, there are m many different names in ancient cultures. For instance, Sumeria was Simut, Param in Persia, Mangala in Sanskrit, and Nirgal in Babylonia. The only name that was familiar to me was Ares. I've heard about Ares before, and Ares is, is just an ancient god referring to the planet of Mars. On Wednesday, we honor Mercury. And in our mother languages, it's all the same. Mercure in French, or Mercure in German, Mercurio in Italian, and Mercurius in Latin. So it's all the same. But in Sumeria, it was Enki. Maybe you've heard about the story of Enki and Enlil in the, in the Sumerian uh, clay tablets uh, in cuneiform. So maybe it was not a god, maybe <laughs> Enki was just a planet. And maybe the same is true for Buddha, the Sanskrit name for, uh, for Mercury. Nabu is the Babylonian name for Mercury and Hermes, maybe you've heard about the stories of Hermes or Hermes Trismegistus in ancient Greece. He was also treated as a god. Maybe it's just a planet. Maybe it's just Mercury. On Thursday we honor Jupiter. And as I said before, the Italian word for Jupiter is Giove. That's why it's called Giove D. On Thursday. Or in ancient Greece it was Jove. It's nearly the same. I think that's where the Italian word comes from. Now we see Enlil. We saw before uh, with Mercury Enki, but... Um, Jupiter is in fact Enlil, so maybe the story of Enki and Enlil is about Jupiter and Mercury. Braspati is Sanskrit, Marduk, maybe you've heard about the stories of Marduk, the legends of Marduk. Maybe also Marduk is just Jupiter. And the same is true for Zeus, Thor, Woden, Odin, and the Latin word Jupiter. They're all names of the same planet, the biggest planet in our solar system. On Friday we honor Venus, or Venere in Italian. And Venere di is Friday, or Venus Day. Ishtar is the Babylonian name. And when you make Ishtar a little bit shorter, then you get Ishtar star. Star. And a star is a bright light. When we look up in the night and there are not many clouds, then we can see a very bright light. And one of them is, is this Ishtar, this star. This is the planet Venus which is bouncing back the sunlight. Aphrodite is a classical name, very famous. It's also referring to Venus, just as Aeneas. And then we have a lot of words that nearly all sound the same. Freya, Freya, Freya and Frige. And they all 
referring to what we now call Friday. It's the day of Freya, Friday. Saturday is the day of Saturn. And many words are actually mean the same, Saturn and Saturno. All comes from the Latin word Saturnus. In ancient Greece it was Kronos, and our chronology, chron <laughs> chronological order uh, is referring to Kronos. Kronos was the god, the keeper of time. Ninurta was the name both in Sumeria and in Babylonia, Sani in Sanskrit, and El and Eli are also reference to Saturn. So please remember the word El or Eli, it's the name of Saturn. And then we get in Persia the word Kaifan, or the name Kaifan. Now a beautiful star in the center of our solar system. Some people call it Sun, or Soleil in French, or Sonne in German, or Sol in Italian. In Sumeria it's called Utu. Babylonia it was Samash, Surya in Sanskrit, Ahau. We also talk a little bit about the Mayan uh, culture, in Maya culture it was called Ahau, meaning the light of the sun, or the sun itself. I use the word Helios. Helios is the ancient Greek's Greek name for the sun. And the Latin word is Sol. We'll also come back to that word, Sol. When we look at our chakras, we have seven inner chakras, they correspond to the seven visible lights, to the five planets including uh, together with the sun and the moon so here we see the relation Luna the moon is related to our root chakra Mercury to the sacrum chakra the solar plexus sacrum is related to Venus in the middle we find the heart chakra and that's related to Helios Mars is to the throat chakra the third eye chakra is related to Jupiter and the crown chakra is related to Saturn when you look at the work of David Wilcock, for instance, he talks a lot about the relation between the pineal gland and uh, the Vatican. I will show later on that the Vatican is very interested in Jupiter. So, uh, in fact, the pineal gland is, is uh, very present uh, in Vatican City. What we see is that the endi the, the, the glands, the endocrine glands, are directly related to each of these chakras. So it's not just about energies, it's also about creating hormones. I will not go into this much in much detail, but if you go to the e-book, Holy Science, I will uh, write a whole uh, chapter on this subject. So that was part one. Now let us look at the literal texts that are used in the Bible, and then especially in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. That is what this second part is about. The days of creation as prescribed in the Bible. It has to do with music, with the seven tones of the scale. We call those tones Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Si, and then Do again. But not many people know that these strange words, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Si, and then Do, are in fact abbreviation of Latin words. And we need to understand that the creation starts from the top and then goes down, so it's top down. It starts at the highest level of Do, and Do is an abbreviation of the Latin word Dominus, meaning the Lord. So it starts with the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. Then the creation goes to a level below Do, and that's the level of Si. And Si stands for the Latin word Sidera, meaning all stars. Below that we find the level of La, and that's an abbreviation of Lactea. People who have lactose intolerance uh, they are not able to digest milk or milky products. So that's Lactea. Lactea means milky. And it's a reference to the Milky Way. I will come back to that. Under that we find the level of Sol. And Sol is the Latin word for the Sun. So this is the level of the Sun, Helios. Then we find the level of Fa on the Sol. And Fa is the abbreviation of Fata. And Fata is a Latin word meaning fate. And when we understand that fate is created by the, uh, the position of the planets in the 12 houses of the zodiac, then we can understand that astrology is trying to teach us something about fate. So that's the level of Fa, related to the planets, the planets in our solar system. Then we arrive at the level of Mi, the microcosm. 
because me is an abbreviation of the Latin word microcosmos. And the microcosm, or the microcosmos, that is our home planets. That's the microcosm within the macrocosm. We'll talk about that later. And then at the bottom, at the lowest level, we find Re. And that's an abbreviation of Regina. And that's the Latin word meaning regent. And the regent in this case is the moon, the moon Luna. So here we see seven levels of, of creation, for instance. Let's go into that more deeper. It starts, it starts at the level of Do, and that means Dominus. But the creation starts at the level of the Lord God Almighty. And the Lord God Almighty creates. And what does he create? It starts with one day, on day one. On day one, God separated the light from the darkness. We need to understand that light means stars, because that's what the light is at, the level, at this level. And on day one, all stars were created. So that means Sidera, abbreviated as C. And we can see here a picture of that level of C, of that level of the creation. This is what we see. We see lights, meaning the stars, or even star systems, galaxies. And in between we see darkness. This is in fact the duality of electricity and magnetism. And we're not going into much detail about this, but uh, later on we'll talk about this. But this is the first level, the level of all stars, the universe, C, Sibira. Then we go to day two. On day two, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. What does this mean? First we need to understand what water means in this context. Water is the rece receiving, uh, is received light. So um, when light is coming to us, it looks, it looks like water, or it, it appears like water. Uh, and that is in fact a star. And so the, the water means stars, and the separated waters, that means the waters in the midst, that is in fact our own galaxy. That means the stars in the middle of all the other stars, they are somehow grouped together. And then we get milky water, and, uh, or white water, light water, and that is in fact Lactea, the level of La. And here we see a picture of Lactea, of the Milky Way. This is how we can see it from our home planet. It's a diagonal line of stars that are connected and they in fact form one galaxy and the other stars are around it. So that is the water divided from the other water in the midst of the water. And here's another picture. Now we see it from the top, from the bottom. And this is the third picture. Now we see it from the side. This is the water in the midst of the water, separated from the other waters. That is what day two of the creation is all about. The level of the Lactea, of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So now let us go to day three. On day three, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered into one place. The gathered waters means bundling of light. And when we bundle a lot of light, so strong, that we cannot see all the other lights, then of course we refer to the Sun Helios. We see here a picture of the Sun Helios. And here you see that all the light is bundled into one place, and the light is so, stark, so strong that we are not able to see any other lights. They are there still, but because this light is so powerful, we are unable to see it. That's what we get at this day. Day 3. Now let us go to day 4. On day 4, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. The signs of the times, because that's what it's all about, the signs of the times are the planets. And the planets wander through the zodiac. And depending on in which house the, these planets are, we know what time it is, what astrological meaning it has. So the planets are the signs of the times. So this is the level of the planets, the planets creating our fate, or fata in Latin, abbreviated as fa. So day four is about the creation of the level of fa. 
and here we see those planets. This picture is not totally true, um, because in fact Venus is a little bit smaller than our home planet Terra. This picture is uh, suggesting the other way around, but that's not true. But we can clearly see how big Jupiter is compared to the other ones. This far out the biggest one. Yeah, from left to right we see first the Sun Helios, then Mercury, then Venus, then Terra, a home planet. Then we see Mars, then Jupiter, and finally Saturn with the rings. And here we see an example on the next slide of the uh, astrological calculations. We see a full circle uh, in which the 12 signs of the zodiac are present, and we can see with the other symbols where each of the planets or the visible lights, I have to say, are which, in which house they are, and uh, what does it actually mean. So this is not a webinar about uh, Western astrology, but this is just to give an idea why it is related to the 12 houses of the zodiac and the planets, the level of time. Now we arrive at day 5. On day 5 God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the firmament of the heavens. First we need to understand that the swarms of living creatures is a reference to the microcosm of me. Because in our microcosm, our home planet, we do indeed find swarms of living creatures. And above that, above the earth, we find uh, all kinds of birds flying, but that are not really birds, those birds are the stars. The birds that fly above the earth, across the firmament of the heavens, that is a reference to the macrocosm. All the stars in the universe, they create the macrocosm around our own microcosm. So day five is about the separation from the microcosm, from the macrocosm. And here we see a picture of that microcosm. Our beautiful blue pool of water home planet. I call it Terra. And the swarms of living creatures, a little part of it, can be seen on this slide. These are mostly mammals. So, yeah, and we know that there are many, many, many more living creatures on our home planet. There, there is indeed, there are indeed many swarms of living creatures. Here. On day six, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them reign over. First we need to understand that the key word here is reign, to reign over, because it's a reference to regions, the region Luna, referring to the Latin word Regina, abbreviated as Re. So day six is about the level of Re. And Luna reigns over the underworld, the, earl, the world beneath our home planet, beneath our microcosm. And man connects the microcosm with the underworld. So that is why man is, is referred to in this day six. It's really important to understand that. So it's both about the connection of man between microcosm and the underworld, and it's about the level of the underworld ruled by uh, Luna, the moon. Regent moon, Luna. And here we can see a picture of how moon, Luna, is uh, regent over the waters. The moon is pulling the oceans towards her and away from her. And that's why it's called, uh, that's why we have the tidal waves. They are ruled by the force of attraction by the moon, Luna. Here we see the six days in a row. It starts on day zero, starts with Do, Dominus, the Lord God Almighty. And that's the level of unity, of wholeness. At that level, everything is one, everything is whole. On the level below that, we see at the level of C, Sidera, the duality between stars and darkness, between electricity and magnetism. That's in fact the, the core essence of our universe, the dynamic, the dynamics between electricity and magnetism. Then we get at the level of La, Lactea, we arrive at the Trinity, the Trinity, for instance, of the three dimensions of space, of the three dimensions of time. Um, I will not talk about that in much detail in this lecture, but there is much more information about this on the website, Pateo Domino. Also a video presentation about the clock of Pisa, explaining the three dimensions of time. But from the level on, from uh, Lactea, we have the 3D reality we live in. Then on day three, 
we arrive at the level of Sol, that's the level of our solar system, and we find in the heart of that solar system the Sun Helios. But Sol is not just referring to the Sun Helios, it's referring to the whole of the solar system. Then we find the level Fa on day 4. Fata, Fate, the wandering lights through the zodiac, which means the planets, the planets within the solar system. And then we find the microcosm, at the level of Mi, day 5. And that's Gaia. Gaia means literally Mother Terra. That's our mother, our home planet, our mother planet. And under that we find Re, Regina, region, moon, Luna. So what we see in fact is that there are seven different worlds, all nested within each other. And we can live in each of those seven worlds at the seven at the same time. At the lowest level, people who are really uh, not really conscious of where they are, those people actually live in the underworld. That's not related to mafia or something, that's an energetic underworld in which you are not conscious of yourself. I will, we will talk about that later on. Our natural level of living, when we arrive on this planet, when we were born, we live at the level of the microcosm, which is surrounding the level of the underworld. When we grow in our consciousness and we start to understand astrology, for instance, then we arrive at the level on top of that, that's the level of all our planets. And if we even increase our consciousness further, then we arrive at the level of our solar system. And then we connect directly to the Sun Helios. But we can go further. We can even connect ourselves to the galaxy. And the heart of that galaxy was called the Hunapu by the Mayans. So when we do that, then we are at that level. And then we live in the third world from the top, which is a really high and big world. But we can even continue. We can even connect ourselves to the whole of the universe. And then we live in the second world from the top. And when we are able to raise up ourselves to the level of, of Christ consciousness, or wholeness consciousness, or unity consciousness, or whatever we like to call it, enlightenment, or samadhi, or satori, all those words mean the same to me, then we arrive at the level of all universes. Because I think the world is even bigger than our own, uh, own universe. I think there are more than one, there's more than one universe. So, we can live in each of these seven worlds, or at, this, at all those seven worlds at the same time, depending on our own consciousness. And just like these Russian dolls, they fit into each other. That's what we need to understand. It's a world within a world, within a world, within a world. It's a, it's a kind of fractal. So that was part two. Now let's move on to part three. We saw in part two the meaning of the first book, the first chapter of the book of Genesis, of the Bible, meaning that there are seven worlds, each ruled by their own, their own level of creator. And now we'll see in this part that the geometry of creation is showing us exactly the same. It starts at the level of wholeness. And at the level of wholeness, we find one. We find a full circle, and that full circle for me is a symbol of oneness or wholeness. To me that's a holy circle, meaning the circle is whole. Uh, but some people call it holy, without the double U and the double L. But for me those words, those words mean the same. Or you can even say, if you remove the double U and the double L, then the word holy means full of holes. That there is some information lacking to understand the whole of it. But that's just playing with words. To me, the, the meaning is in fact the same. There's nothing holy about it, in the sense that we are not able to, to grasp it, that we're not able to understand it, because we can fully understand it. It's just knowledge of the whole, information of the whole. But the knowledge has been kept secret for many, many years. And the purpose of the School of the Holy Science is to make this, this sacred science, or this secretly kept science, open and public, so that everybody can, can learn from it, and can understand it. And you can no longer be, mis be misled or be fooled by the powers to be or the powers that were, perhaps. And when you make things whole, then you are healing. To make something heal means to make something whole again. To bring it back in the state of unity. So it starts at the level of one, oneness, the full circle. 
at the second level, we arrive at two circles, overlapping. And the perimeter of each circle is going through the heart of the other circle. So they touch each other in the heart. And I symbolize that with a full circle divided into two equal parts. And also the symbol of Tao, the symbol of yin and yang, at the right hand side at the bottom line, the bottom corner, bottom right corner, uh, is also referring to that duality of yin and yang, of the male and the female, or the up and the down, or the lightness and the darkness, or whatever we want to call it. Um, and even the symbol of the Fesica Pisces is referring to that same duality, because that's in fact the, the overlapping parts of the two circles, plus a little bit extra to give a tail to the fish. So the level of C is the level of duality. The geometry of La is the geometry of the Trinity, the Holy Trinity for some people. That's just the Trinity of the whole, because a Trinity is symbolized with a circle in which we find a triangle. So the triangle within the circle is the Holy Trinity, Trinity within the whole. And that's symbolized by three circles, each cr uh, crossing through the heart, the hearts of the other circles. And when we connect those hearts, then we get a triangle. And when we focus on the overlapping part of these, tri these circles, then we get the figure, the bottom right side. And that's what we find in many cathedrals. It's just a symbol for the Trinity. It's one over three. And the geometry of soul, it is 1 over 6. So it's going up now to 6. And that's what we, then we arrive at the level uh, of, of this geometry. We find one circle in the middle, in the middle of this page, and then we see that there are 6 circles surrounding it. So there we find the number 6. And when we connect the hearts of those 6 surrounding circles, then we get the shape of the hexagon. We don't need to explain this to our honeybees because they, <laughs> they are very familiar with this uh, shape because that's what they use to create uh, the honeycombs. And within that hexagon, there perfectly fits two triangles, so two complementary triangles. And that ancient symbol is called the Seal of Solomon. Please see the resemblance between Sol and Solomon. Solomon is in fact Sol or Mon. And Sol refers to the sun, just like the word Ra is referring to the sun. We'll come back to that later. And Omon is in fact in ancient Egypt, Amon. So Amon Ra is exactly the same as Sol Omon. I hope that it's clear. So this is just the symbol of the sun. This symbol, two triangles within, uh, uh, mirrored, mirrored image within each other, that is the symbol of Solomon. Now we go to the level of Pa, and when we count now the circles in the outer uh, perimeter, then we see that there are 12 circles surrounding the previous seven. So there's one in the middle, that is the level of unity of one, of Do. Then we have one, then we have six surrounding it, that is the level of Sol. And now we find 12 surrounding that six, and that is the level of Pa, the geometry of Pa. When we look at the original circle in the middle, then we see that there are in fact six kind of leaves coming from the, uh, from the middle, and there are also six at the perimeter of that circle. So it makes a total of 12. So that means that the original circle in the middle has 12 yeah, so-called leaves, but all the other ones have less than 12. When we give each of these circles, each of these 19 circles, 12 of these leaves, then we get the symbol of the flower of life, with also a new circle around the whole shape. That's what we see at the left hand side. That's the flower of life, in which each circle has 12 leaves. And that's also a very ancient and beautiful symbol, very powerful. I use the symbol at the right hand side, at the bottom. It's just a circle divided into 12 equal parts. To me, that's the symbol of the level of Pa. At the level of me, the geometry of me, we now find 24 circles at the perimeter. So now there are 12, 24 circles surrounding the previous shape. And to symbolize that, I use a circle divided into 24 equal parts. 
And this is an important shape, because here we see the shape again. But now let us look at how many circles there are next to each other. And that's what we see here. We see one circle in the middle, the original one, and then in six directions there are two circles next to it. Makes a total of 13 circles. 13 to me is a very important number. Some people think it's a number of uh, bad luck, but those people are misinformed. They are ignorant of the true meaning of 13. 13 is the number of creation. In my videos about the Mayan calendar, I talk a lot about that. But it's not in this webinar. But please remember that 13 years have nothing to do with bad luck. It has to do with creation. With a little bit of imagination, when you try to imagine yourself that this is a 3D shape, not a 2D shape, when you imagine it as a 3D shape, then it looks like a cube. Just see the, the original circle, the one closest to you, and then perhaps you're able to see a cube in here. And that cube has a name. The name is the cube of Metatron. And here you see that cube. And in this shape, these 13 circles are connected to each other with straight lines through the hearts. So each line, each circle is connected to each other circle with a straight line from heart to heart. And these lines are very important because we can use these lines to draw the so-called platonic shapes. There are five beautifully perfect platonic shapes which we can draw by using these lines. Um, please notice that it's, it's the two-dimensional shadow shape. It's not, in fact, a 3D shape because it's in a flat uh, surface. It's just on paper. But when we imagine it, it looks like a 3D shape. For instance, at the right-hand upper corner, we see the hexahedron. Some people call it a cube, but it's, in fact, a shape with six faces. On the left-hand lower side, we see the octahedron. It's a shape with eight faces. Octa means eight. Icosahedron we see in the middle, down, and the dodecahedron we find at the bottom right corner. At the upper left corner we see the tetrahedron. And we see not one but we see in fact two tetrahedrons, one and one at the back two. And when we imagine uh, this, these two tetrahedrons within each other, then we get the shape of the star tetrahedron. It's also called the Merkaba. And when we try to see what kind of shadow the star tetrahedron gives in two dimensions, then we get again the seal of Solomon. That is the figure in the middle top position. So that's in fact the shadow of the figure to the left. And the star tetrahedron, the figure on the top left corner, is an important uh, shape because that's in fact the Merkaba. And that's our light body. We have four different types of bodies. The physical body, but the three others too. And one of those three others is the light body. I'll come back to that later. And to the left we see the male or the young shape of the energies. And to the left we see the yin shape, the female shape. So they are complementary to each other. Now we go to the level with the most circles. That's the level of the geometry of Re, Regina. And if we count now, we find 48 circles on the outside, on the perimeter. And to symbolize that, I use the symbol at the right hand corner, bottom. Um, it's a full circle divided into 48 equal parts. So to summarize, the ray of creation starts at the level of Do, which was a full circle. Then we arrive at the level of C, a circle divided into two. Then we arrive at the level of La, a circle divided into three. Then we get a circle divided into six, at the level of Sol. Then divided into twelve, that's the level of Fa. Then divided into twenty-four, the level of Mi. And finally, the level of Re, divided into forty-eight. So when we look from left to right, we see the ray of creation. It starts at the top level, the level of Do, the Lord God Almighty, Dominus. And, but when we go the other way around, that is in fact the stairway of ascension. When we arrive on this planet, we at, are at the level of me, the microcosm. But because of many uh, reasons, most people fall to the level of the underworld, the level of Re, Regina. And they have to go, if they want to go home again, they have to bring their consciousness up first to me, 
then to fa, then to sol, then to la, then to si, and finally to the level of do, where there is unity or wholeness consciousness. So the ray of creation is the opposite direction as the stairway of ascension. And what we in fact do is we find our way, our way back to where we came from. We find our way back to home, so to say. Now we arrive at part four of the science of creation, and it's about numbers. And if we, if we have uh, looked carefully to the previous part, we've seen the numbers already, because they were already there. We started with the number one. The number one is the level of Do, Do means the Lord God Almighty. That's the level of unity, of wholeness, of oneness. One full circle. And everything on the circle is the same. It doesn't matter where you are at the perimeter, it is the same position relative to the center, the same distance. So that's why the circle represents the whole. And there are infinite, there's an infinite number of spaces on the on the perimeter of the circle, because <laughs> yeah, that's that's infinity, and you can go go, go round in an infinite number of times. So it's infinity in the oneness in the wholeness. Then we arrive at the level of C, and the number there is two. The number two stands for duality, or polarity. There's duality between the stars and darkness, or the duality between light and uh, darkness, or the duality between male and female, or yin and yang, or any other duality, up or down, in or out. It's all the same. That is the duality we find at the level of two, uh, the level of C, which represents the number two. On La, the day two, we arrive at the level of uh, Lactea, and that is, at the essence, is three, Trinity. And here we see that Trinity symbolized. It is the duality between yin and yang, between white and black, or light and darkness. And there is a third one. The third one is in between. Some say, say yin, yang, and yen. The yen is the third one, in between. And the third one is both yin and both yang. And that's that's yeah that's really important to understand. And from the level of Lactea, from our Milky Way down, everything we encounter is in fact a duality, uh, a trinity between the duality and the third neutral point. Uh, for instance, the electron, neutron, and the proton. Uh, there are many other examples of this. In my book, I give a number of those examples. You can also say positive, negative, and zero. It's all in here. So that's, that's the level of Lactea, 3. And from here we start to double. And the figure for doubling is this beautiful symbol. On the next slide. Maybe you are familiar with the work of um, Marco Rodin or Randy Powell. Randy Powell is also working.